Aloha and welcome to Our Homes, Ending the Housing Crisis. I'm today's host, Ian Ross. I'm a former legislative aide to Senator Stanley Chang. My background is in public policy and advocacy, where I've worked in a variety of roles for the last nine years, both in the legislature, as well as in grassroots organizing and advocacy. As a side note, I actually spent eight years of my life in Australia with my whole dad's side of the family still living in Australia. So today's uh, topic is of uh, extra interest to me. The topic for today's webinar is the big housing build in Victoria, Australia. To help us learn more about the Victoria, Australia's big housing build, an ambitious plan to build 10,000 new affordable homes, is Parliamentary Secretary Sheena Watt. Sheena Watt is an Australian politician who has served in the Victorian Legislative Council for the Northern Metropolitan Re Region since 2020. She's the first Indigenous Australian woman to represent the Australian Labour Party in the Parliamentary of Victoria. She is the point person for the Big Housing Build, and this is an ambitious social housing plan, and uh, which will be building these homes across the regional Victoria area. Mahalo for joining us today, Parliamentary Secretary. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so very, very much uh, to you, Mr. Ross, and uh, first and foremost to uh, Senator Chang for the invitation. This is a, uh, a really exciting opportunity to share uh, with you all some of the things that are happening in my home state down uh, very, what is it, about a 10 and a half hour flight away. Uh, and I begin, as is my cultural uh, custom and protocol, uh, by acknowledging the First Peoples, the Indigenous Peoples of uh, Australia. I am in Melbourne, as you mentioned, and that's home for more than 60,000 years to the Wurundjeri people of the Greater Kulin Nation. I um, pay my respects to their elders past and present. My um, my connections are a little bit further north up on uh, river country uh, in a place called uh, Yorta Yorta country. So I'm a uh, freshwater baby, as you say. Uh, so I acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And can I just extend my respects to um, any First Peoples uh, from other nations that may be joining us today and acknowledge the work of any um, First Nations people involved in delivering safe and secure homes to our community. Now I have a, a, a slide deck and I'd like to just take a moment to share that now if that's all right. Let me see if I can work Absolutely. on it. Absolutely, please go ahead. <laughs> now has that come on up? Yes, we can see it uh, clearly, thank you. See that one? Lovely, lovely. Uh, so I'll just... Um, where am I up to? <clears throat> now, all right, so today really is a um, important day as I get to share what it is that we do uh, and I'm really delighted to be here with you all uh, and it's really fantastic to have an opportunity to hear and share knowledge um, from our, uh, really our, our shared commitment to providing everyone in our community with a, a safe, secure uh, place to call home. Uh, programs such as the Big Housing Build, uh, which I'll talk more about in a moment, have such an important role um, in our, you know, in the work that we do as a state. But the sharing of knowledge uh, today really does um, continue to build our strong relationship uh, that we have and the many ties that we have with the United States. And as the closest state uh, to Australia, uh, it's worth acknowledging that as well. Uh, I hope that in coming together we can celebrate and share what we've achieved so far and hopefully leave you with some thoughts for the future. Uh, I am coming to you from Victoria, as I said. It's, it's a small state on the... Um, in the big island home that we uh, we all love uh, here. And of course, I'm quite far south. That's why I'm, and we're in the middle of winter. That's why I'm all a little bit wrapped up at the moment. Uh, of course, it is the southernmost part and the southernmost um, big city of Australia. Of course, we've got that small uh, island state, Tasmania, a little further south. Now, uh, I'm around, what did it be say? Five and a half thousand miles from you today. Uh, which I was told, I had to do some looking into this, is the equivalent of travelling from Los Angeles to New York and back again. So just for those folks who maybe haven't had the good pleasure that, like you've had Mr Ross of spending some time here in Australia. 
Now, Victoria is a incredibly vibrant, it's a multicultural and it's really a thriving state. We are the fastest growing state in the country uh, and have a population of 6.7 million. So, and I'm in the capital. Now, in March of this year, so only a few short weeks ago, our city, uh, Melbourne, officially overtook Sydney uh, to become the largest city in Australia. And Melbourne now has a population of 5.2 million uh, people, which is projected to grow to 11 million uh, by 2056. So I hope that that's um, uh, helpful. Uh, of course, there's some other stats there, which is a bit sooner, uh, which is the 2041 getting to 8.4 million. Now, housing in Victoria is, uh, well, there's certainly some things to talk about there. Housing growth, housing affordability and housing attainability are key issues in our community whether they live in Melbourne or our regional areas uh, across our state. And I want to take some time uh, in this webinar to outline some of the uh, key drivers uh, that put a range of pressure on our housing system and what our uh, government has uh, done in response to that. I'll take a moment to um, cast our minds back to the first half of 2020. And um, there were certainly pressures on our housing system and of course, uh, the coronavirus pandemic was having an enormous impact. At that time, uh, housing affordability had deteriorated more in Australia than in comparable countries overseas. Uh, this had come about because over the last 20 years, average capital city dwelling prices had risen 200% compared to an 82% rise in wages. And at the same time, uh, there were pressures on our housing system from increased numbers of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, and there were around 53,000 people on the social housing uh, waiting list and many, many more experiencing rental stress in the private, uh, the private rental market. The cost of purchasing a home uh, continues to rise and very few private rentals are affordable to people on uh, the lowest incomes. Uh, many of our essential workers, those that we value most, I'm talking about our teachers, our nurses, our police, uh, our first responders, uh, were also finding it hard to access housing uh, that was affordable but also close to employment. And for us, the um, pandemic certainly highlighted the importance of having a safe and secure home. And um, it's made us change the way we thought about home, the way we think about community and the way we think about work. And it also led to some dislocations in the housing market. Now, regional areas in our state are a good example of this, where declining affordability was coupled with a significant decrease in the av availability of homes. As people left the capital to wait out the pandemic in our regional areas. Uh, and this had an enormous impact, of course, on, uh, on our state, but mostly our regional communities. And we did see a sharp uplift in uh, folks experiencing rental stress uh, in our, the regional areas of our state. And it certainly grew the, um, the waiting list for uh, public housing. So we also had during that time, and um, you know, there were many stories about how it was that we addressed the um, pandemic, but we had some public health emergency measures uh, that came into place that really were very much um, with an eye to the um, housing market. This included a moratorium on rental evictions and a changing dynamic in the private rental market. Uh, so this meant that our social housing demand uh, remained high and waiting list numbers grew. As I said, we had folks leaving the capital to go out to regional Victoria. Um, our low-income regional communities weren't able to then um, be able to access regional housing. We had a real uplift in numbers applying for 
um, government supported housing in regional uh, in regional areas. And what we did very much so was to uh, seek advice and took some steps forward to respond to that. So what came about was the big housing build. So in November of 2020, uh, the government announced a $5.3 billion investment. So that's, I'm just going to talk in all Australian uh, dollars. Uh, so that's a $5.3 billion Australian investment into the big housing build uh, to deliver an ambitious goal of 12,000 new homes across the state by 2026. So the big housing build was designed to deliver a net increase of 10% in social housing supply in around, around a four year um, time period. The big housing build is the largest single investment in social and affordable housing in our state's entire history. And uh, it's worth noting here, it's the biggest investment in all of Australia and that includes by the federal government. So none have equaled the enormous investment of 5.3 billion into um, social and affordable housing like we have. So this was enormously ambitious. There's no um, shying away from that. We created a specialist delivery agency to make it come to life. And we called that Homes Victoria. And from the outset, we were really clear about what Homes Victoria and the big housing build was about. It's more homes for more Victorians but it was also critically about delivering quality homes. So, as I said, these were some of the uh, key drivers. There were um, 57,000 people on the uh, wait list and um, the big housing build has carried a really strong commitment to deliver homes that were really well designed and environmentally sustainable. Uh, as I you know, said earlier, our winters are cold and our summers are really warm. Uh, so that means that we need homes that are well designed, uh, but comfortable, efficient to run and cheaper to keep cool in summer and warm in winter. All of the new homes, uh, and this is uh, worth folks knowing, all of the new homes have been designed to meet a seven star nationwide housing energy rating scheme. Uh, energy efficiency standards. So the seven number um, is very new for us, but we're being quite bold and ambitious about having energy efficiency in, um, in these homes. Um, there's no use moving in really vulnerable people into um, beautiful homes if it takes all their spare money just to pay the energy bills and that to us didn't make sense. So we wrapped up very strongly into that, some strong targets around energy efficiency and having a, um, an, you know, a seven star energy efficiency rating scheme attached to this program was incredibly important. Uh, now, what we can see is um, we also, we had some other objectives beyond just energy efficiency because Whilst that was great and we had some, you know, some really strong targets, there were some other things that we thought we could be bold enough uh, to, uh, to, to challenge ourselves on as we went about building these uh, 12,000 homes. So we also set out that it would, that it would support key cohorts uh, and to deliver an extensive range of social and economic benefits. Now, Beyond building $5.3 billion in homes, we expect that it will deliver $6.7 billion in economic activity across the state. And the big housing bill build, sorry, uh, will create a jobs boom. And those jobs, well, they need to be uh, for the young and um, the inexperienced as well. So there will be 40,000 jobs created across the four key years of the program. And we have mandated that 10%, 10% of all work on these projects will be undertaken by apprentices and trainees, uh, and including opportunities to increase female participation in construction, 
Uh, we have um, uh, some gender equity challenges and gender equality challenges in the construction industry in our state and we're taking that on by making sure that when the government is building things that we are providing opportunities for um, women to you know take a job and um, and thrive of course uh, there will also be opportunities within these apprenticeships and cadetships and these traineeships as well to uh, have opportunities for social housing renters. So we thought maybe there's something about being involved in the building of your own home that's um, really quite special. And so seeing folks that are already in um, public housing or government housing, I'm not sure what the um, term is that you use there, um, taking up opportunities to take on an apprenticeship and, um, um, you know, and build a home for the first time is incredibly special. Uh, so I, I'm also very pleased to talk a little bit about where these homes are going because it is um, really very clear that putting them all in the capital city is not going to be ideal for us. There are all these housing pressures, as we said, out in the regional areas of our state. So a quarter of the big housing build, or that's about 1.25 billion, is being invested in new housing in our regional areas uh, to create much needed housing in our growth cities and uh, our tourism areas. We have um, very strong um, tourism in regional Victoria. We have quite a number of great foodie places. Uh, we've got some marvelous, um, at, you know, ancient places that uh, attract people from all over the world, but we've got challenges in finding affordable housing for the workers to support our um, tourism industry in regional Victoria. So it was great to see that. But we've also got some regional areas that might not have uh, tourism opportunities and they are a little underserved when it comes to, um, you know, social and uh, community services as well as having, um, you know, the workers live there. And so it becomes a real challenge for us. And so I'm really pleased to say that we are also looking at underserviced regional communities. Uh, we have mandated that 10%, 10% uh, of the new, 10% um, of the, no, wait up, where am I up to? Oh, yeah, I mentioned that. Sorry, I've realised I've left, left myself behind. 10% um, of the new social housing in the big housing build will deliver to Aboriginal Victorians uh, in, um, in line with our commitment to providing more housing opportunities for uh, Indigenous peoples from our state uh, and also that they will be uh, self-determined by Aboriginal people and Aboriginal specific housing providers. So that's your, um, we've got a number of Indigenous specific housing um, providers and we'll be working with them to deliver these um, housing to them. So we've also know that there are a number of um, small, like not small, <laughs> rather large actually, um, vulnerable cohorts. They include um, people escaping family violence, and we also have uh, a commitment as a result of a recent Royal Commission, which is a, a large scale inquiry uh, into mental health in our state. So we will be having 2000 homes uh, will be provided for people experiencing mental illness. Uh, we've also got 1000 homes specifically earmarked for people escaping by family violence. And of that around 250 have already been funded. Uh, the um, those homes for victim survivors of family violence, we understand that there are additional um, requirements and so they are maintained um, and built to a very high safety standard there. Some of them may include um, cameras and other measures, um, additional locks, fences, etc. cetera, uh, just to, you know, bring that peace of mind to family violence victim survivors. And so it's really um, exciting to see that there are um, safe and appropriate housing uh, for victim survivors and their families. So 
that's for us something that we're enormously proud of, but we're keeping a very sharp eye on. Up to um, 1,100 homes, uh, that's 1,100 homes, will be built through an innovative, what we call a ground lease model approach. Now, this is where public land uh, owned by the state is leased from Homes Victoria, that's the agency I spoke about earlier, uh, to a project group that will finance, design and construct new housing. So this is usually, uh, we've got a not-for-profit community housing provider that will manage and maintain each housing site for 40 years before handing the land and all the dwellings back to the state. So an example of that might be a women's specific um, or a family violence specific housing provider. Uh, they, they know what needs to happen um, to build safe, secure uh, housing for victim survivors and we work with them. It could also be a, um, you know, someone that specialises in mental health appropriate housing models uh, or it could be um, a provider that might understand, you know, that region and what works, uh, particularly where we might have um, higher needs as a result of natural disasters and emergencies. We have some areas that have um, high susceptibility to floods and fires in our state. Uh, and so we are working um, with some specialist providers on that. Uh, these sites will deliver an integrated model of social, affordable and specialist disability. And that's a, that's a, a big one as well. Um, and market rental homes that are welcoming, secure and meet our modern design and accessibility standards. Now, uh, this is, um, next slide is, I'll just, if I go back to this other one, see these towers here, you can see them. That is our um, high density public housing towers that we've had in the state since about the, the sort of 60s, 70s. That was the original model of how we, how we used to do it. Um, they are all home to, um, they're still currently occupied, but you can see that site down below where we're building something new and exciting. Uh, now, this next slide is Ascot Vale, which is a suburb in, um, in our state. It is um, sort of an inner city suburb. I'm talking um, from, the, from the middle of the city to get to Ascot Vale, uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes is probably, I think, a fair, a fair um, estimation. Uh, this project here that's been recently completed uh, features uh, 100 social homes and 100 uh, affordable rental homes and as you can see features some really high quality design. This um, is our recent, uh, I'll go to our next one, this is Ashburton, this is a little bit further out, we're talking more the sort of 45 minutes um, zones from the, from the central business district. Uh, in Melbourne, this features 111 public housing homes and 67 affordable rental homes, and will create that real integrated community. Our projects are well located within, um, you know, very close distance to our train station, shops, sports and school grounds. Uh, all our homes are tenure blind. I'm not sure if that's a term that's familiar to you, but tenure blind means that big housing build new homes do not look any different from other new homes coming onto the market. Now, if you fast forward to today, we have, um, uh, we've now just over two years into our big housing build. We now have 7,600 uh, homes in planning or construction, and we have $3 billion in contracts. 2,000 households have either moved in or have their bags packed, and they're very, very keen and eager to move in. We have 900 sites across Victoria in our pipeline. Uh, and this um, on your screen can give you a sense of the size and diversity of the big housing build and where we're up to right now. So we're pretty, uh, we're pretty proud, I've got to say. Um, as you can see from our next slide, which I'll just get to now, there's, you know, the different sites there. And I think I'll just see if I can play that for you. Biggest ever investment in social housing by any state or territory. The state government's vowed to pump more than $200 million into social housing. 79 social housing units are being built in the Latrobe Valley. 
Hundreds of social housing units are being built across the inner suburbs. Developments of 25 new homes in Borsham. New housing complex in Dandenong. The investment's expected to create more than 900 jobs. To create more than 130 Western Victorian jobs. The development is now well underway and tenants should be able to move in by early 2024. This will change lives, it will save lives. It's an apartment block offering safe, permanent accommodation to women and children with support services built in. As demand grows, social and affordable options are being boosted. In the last 12 months, we've done 33 homes here. It is expected to welcome its first residents mid next month. Hundreds of vulnerable Victorians now have a roof over their head with more than a thousand new dwellings built across the state to help tackle homelessness. Almost 100 new homes have been completed in Ballarat with more than 200 still being constructed as part of the state government's big housing build. The latest grants from the Social Housing Growth Fund can make a massive difference in Mildura and in Swan Hill too. 114 modular homes are being built across the state, including in Warrnambool, Portland, Colac and Ararat, at a cost of $30 million. Well, the big housing build is actually beginning to have an impact already. There are 200 homes either under construction or already delivered in the Bendigo area. Being in my own home, I feel safe. Having a secure housing, it's had a, a massive impact on my life. There's no way to describe the way I feel. It's just an amazing feeling to be given this, to be given the opportunity to, to live again. Think it's ever investment in so there you go um so as you can see uh there is a lot happening and the big housing build in our state is coming to life you can hear the stories of people which to me is just um so very powerful uh but when someone gets their keys for the first time that is uh all the joy uh you'll need to see uh this is really life-changing and in this year we expect to unveil around uh 3200 new homes and this will be the most this will be the most homes ever opened in a single year in Victoria by the state. So this is incredible. And with each new home, we were growing the social housing sector itself. And importantly, with every new home, we are easing pressure on the housing system. Of course, there is uh, some innovation wrapped up in this that we're, uh, we're worth, uh, worth exploring, I think, today. Uh, our vision for creating the big housing build and Homes Victoria was to deliver certainty and thousands of homes to uh, people in our state. We also thought that maybe there's some opportunity for innovation as well. So you can see from those designs from the video, and I hope that that was uh, clear for you all to see. Um, uh, I... Um, that we responded by having a sort of a real co-design process and where lived experience of people was really valuable. That's why having, you know, people that were victim survivors of family violence talk to us about what they're looking for in safety-wise in their new home. It mattered <laughs> and it mattered and, uh, you know, you heard the stories about people feeling safe for the first time. We're also seeing that agencies from other states are showing a real interest and they're wanting to set up here. Uh, we're pretty proud of that um, because, you know, any time that we can, uh, you know, attract um, some new interest into our state to help um, support our most vulnerable is a very good thing. Uh, we've also got some end-of-life assets, including a, um, 
you know, a real need to redevelop some of them. And you've seen um, those towers that I showed earlier. Uh, and so one of the redevelopments that was recently announced in our election, which was in November of last year, was to put air conditioning units in them. They don't actually have air conditioning units. And so for the first time, we'll be seeing air conditioning units going to those towers. It's going to make an enormous difference. And that's heating and cooling. So those split system arrangements. Now, uh, there are also a few of those agencies uh, moving into regional areas. Like I said, you know, these some of these areas are underserviced and have been for a long time. But through this critical investment, um, these organisations are feeling that there's enough um, support for them to venture out into regional areas. We're also seeing an, uh, a large number of private investment investors coming onto the horizon with some new and interesting and innovative ways of thinking. So we are uh, really, really, um, you know, delighted to hear some new ideas. And even yesterday, I was out hearing some, um, meeting some folks with some rent to build models and others. And right throughout, uh, the projects carry a, what I said, an overall commitment to quality design, energy efficiency, durability, and that neighbourhood integration. You can see the quality of these homes in that video and what that means for um, the neighbours. These are not um, going to be eyesores in the community. They're places that people are really proud to live and proud to see um, go up. Of course, as I said, part of that pride also comes from the tenure blind model that nobody walking down the street knows that that's, that's an apartment block for social housing. It's just, it's just not known. And for us, that's a really good thing. In the 60s and 70s and even, you know, later on, we built all these homes and everybody knew which were the public housing homes because they all had the exact same fence. <laughs> they were built to be exactly the same. They're on the same spot on the land. Um, the roof was the same. It, everybody knew. <laughs> Even the letterboxes are all the same. That is over. Uh, and I am really um, proud of like tenure blind um, models and am championing them as much as I can. I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you about all the things that we're doing uh, here in our state. And I hope that there's some good questions uh, to come to me. And I look forward to, um, you know, talking to you again. But thank you to you, uh, Mr. Ross, and of course, um, Senator Chang, for your um, time today and the opportunity to talk to you about the big housing building. I'll uh, hand it over to you. <laughs> wow, well, thank you so much for that really engaging presentation and helping us learn more about this very ambitious project. Uh, it's really exciting to see how much of it is coming online uh, in such a short time horizon. You know, very often we talk about these ambitious plans, you hear about them. There's a whole lot of commitments 10, 20 years down the line. So it's always very exciting to hear about the stuff that's coming on uh, almost immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, so before we get to some of the questions, and I do want to remind everyone, you can submit questions down at the bottom. It says Q&A. You can click it and put some questions. I want to give a little bit of context from some folks. Uh, so right now, the Australian to uh, US dollar, because you were talking in Australian dollars. Yes. Uh, so for our audience, might appreciate it's currently 0.68, or $1 can be traded for 1.47 Australian dollars which you had mentioned tourism earlier in Victoria, it tells me I really need to come visit Australia soon. Please do. <laughs> um, additionally, uh, as someone who is a former resident of Australia, I was actually really surprised when I saw the news earlier this month that Victoria had overtaken Sydney. You know, mm -hmm. uh, being like an eight-year-old in Australia, it always seemed like Sydney was like the one really big thing going on. So it's so fascinating to hear uh, how vibrant and fast-growing uh, Victoria, so thank you for that little uh, mm. view of things. Yes. So yeah. the big- Took some sorry, of us by surprise too, can I just say? <laughs> <laughs> um, so was it something uh, more recent that like the population growth was turned to overdrive or has this been like a slow and steady wins the race kind of situation? Uh, more the former, I think. It, it, we were on, tra on track um, in this, years before COVID, but mm -hmm. um, I think COVID sort of it, it took a, a, a lot of people left our state during that time and thought I'll uh, go up north to the sun and the 
surf, uh, but people have returned here for the opportunities and uh, people have come back as well that we might not have anticipated, but quite a few folk have gone, yeah, you know what, um, there's a lot to know and to like, so I think I'll come on back. So, yeah. So, some folks are going to make uh, a whole lot of political waves writing a demographics book about how the pandemic shifted everyone's expectations of the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one big question that's come up from our folks, and I did tell you early on that they'd be a little bit wonky, so we're keeping true to it. Uh, Dennis and an anonymous uh, viewer asked, can you talk about more about financing? Specifically, they want to hear more about the construction side and financial supports offered to the residents, as they were noting that it appears that you're offering sub-market rental rates. Ah, yes. Well, firstly, thanks, Dennis, for the question. Radio. Now, let me talk a little bit about that question of financing. This has been uh, financed entirely from the state and the state budget. So we did seek support uh, for this from the federal government at the time, uh, noting, of course, that, uh, you know, we had a very, very big list and uh, lots of folks um, that were experiencing homelessness. Uh, ultimately, under our constitution, um, their, the responsibility to address homelessness is a federal responsibility. Uh, and they, through a partnership with the states, actually, um, you know, we deliver lots of the services or um, do a fair bit. But no, that was entirely funded by the state. So there you go. Uh, we've also got a, um, a lot of, you know, assets as a state as well. So I'll just have a look and see if I can find... Um, some details around that so we have um like i said there's a sort of agreement that happens between all of the states and territories uh, and the federal government that's called our national housing and homelessness agreement and uh that equates to about um i don't know like a billion dollars a year uh so we use that to then um support frontline homelessness and family violence services uh, and there is really no ongoing funding uh, for us to do the upgrade of the homes so that is done entirely through um, rentals of the um, you know rentals so just so you know we have a um, uh, kind of calculation that's done for folks that live in these homes so you can't under our rules uh, a, a vast majority of these folks are on statutory incomes these are the pensions and uh, age pension or disability pensions or um, they might be seeking employment and we have a, sort of a job seeker program uh, where you've you know funded for welfare by the state now under our system, if you're in one of these, one of our homes, you can't pay more than 30% of your um, income in rent. So it is, um, that's how these things fund themselves. And uh, there you go. So the state funded it. Obviously, we've been receiving income from te rent uh, tenants, sorry. Um, and that's uh, marked at a maximum of 30% of the income. Is that what you're looking for? I'm hoping so. If not, yes, I, I think that, put, I a, think that put, a, put a question in and we can, I can get back to you. <laughs> I think you may have gotten most of it there. Uh, anonymous yeah. though, I'm gonna like get them jump the line because I think this is relevant on the question of financing. Are yeah. all the projects on state or government owned land or does the state go out and acquire the land for this department? Yeah, okay, so we have four different models when yeah. it comes to the land, right? <laughs> so one is um, we already, um, we're like we're renovating or redeveloping, right? New uh, existing houses, like I said, those towers earlier. Number two is we've got land that we owned. We've just never done we haven't maximized it. Now, as you see from that earlier photo where we had the towers, we had that space in front. Now, that had been sort of, I don't know, 
a playground or grass or something and we've just decided or it could have we that so that's owned by homes victoria or owned by the government agency responsible number three is the third is that there's other government land so it could be that we've got some land owned by the railway corporation we have land that's owned by i don't know it could be a previously closed down um, hospital or a, um, a school that you know has been changed or moved or whatever so there's a lot of um, land in the, the broader state government portfolio and through agreement we're able to um, you know purchase that from one government agency purchases it from another uh, that's um, really popular particularly with those um, parcels of land that are near the train lines the, 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 uh, the Victorian Rail Corporation actually owns a lot of land um, around uh, train tracks. And so wanting to have places that are social and affordable housing near public transport uh, has meant that we have gone um, very much to our friends at the Railway Corporation and said, what have you got for us? We're looking for something near the train lines and they've been able to unlock some opportunities. So that's a sort of third model. Uh, and the fourth model is, of course, that we buy it on the open market. And we've done that as well. Uh, but the cheeky thing is, and I'll just let folks know, we don't tell them that we're the government. Uh, because as soon as they find out that the government is looking to buy this land, the prices mysteriously jump very, very high. Uh, so uh, maybe don't tell folks that. Um, but uh, having somebody purchase that on our behalf um, or a sort of, you know, a private agency is actually incredibly important for us to get that value for money. Um, we know that people know that when the government's buying, you can, oh, maybe we should, you know, reconsider that price model. And so that's been really important for us as well. So they're the sort of four ways that we um, find land to build these 12,000 homes. Your face lit up with that question. And I could just immediately tell this is one that you're like, yes, I get to show off some knowledge on this one. Yeah, I've got to say, I have looked at spots for a really long time and you didn't even think to imagine that that could be a home to some folks. Like it could be a kind of a junkyard near a rail yard and all of a sudden um, it's now a thriving community of that, you know, of people. And how is it that we kept some of these places in such prime, prime areas for community we just kept them sitting there for all these months and all these years rather, and sometimes decades. Uh, but, you know, through having a real focused um, look at it, we we're able to unlock it and have some friendly conversations with our friends at the Railway Corporation. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we always love to hear about some transit oriented development as we call it here. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's a good way to put it. Maybe I'll use that in the future. Well, there we go, we're spreading uh, TOD. Um, so one of the, uh, questions that we wanted to ask you was what are some of the uh, biggest obstacles and resistance to development, including building new housing? It sounds like you have all of these approaches for like acquiring land and what you're doing. So you must be working around some particular set of problems on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you tell us more about those? Okay. Um, one, <laughs> problem is that it's enormously challenging now in Australia to the construction market. It's, um, we just don't have enough construction professionals <laughs> uh, to do the work that we wanted to do. Um, it wasn't like we had folks sitting around waiting in hope that they could be unlocked to deliver 12,000, um, you know, housing, 12,000 dwellings. Uh, so one was a real workforce challenge. Uh, two was uh, supplies. Uh, it's been enormously challenging to get supplies, particularly from the overseas market. We knew that, um, you know, we've been impacted by the importation of wood products from Europe. <laughs> uh, that's for us one that was a little surprising, but has been enormously impactful. Uh, and having to pay quite a premium for construction um, products. And uh, probably if I go to other challenges, one was about even thinking about the where. You know, we had um, 
folks that had traditionally had very high, higher density um, public and social and government housing. And, but we were bold enough to say, no, 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 no. Maybe it's worth us thinking about other areas, you know, that have been historically underrepresented when it comes to um, government housing. Uh, the ones that come to mind are, you know, our upper income areas, uh, um, even our upper middle class areas. They uh, didn't have high, you know, anywhere near the sort of density of um, government housing. So I know that uh, there was a little bit of pushback. Surprisingly, not really. Um, but you know, everyone deserves a home and these homes uh, should be everywhere. So that's, um, there's some of the challenges that um, happen, just, you know, supplies, you know, professionals and all the rest of it, yeah. And also, yeah, challenges from neighbours and, uh, yeah. I'm happy to go into that in a bit more depth if there's any interest in that one. That was actually the next question about if there was any pushback. Uh, we call uh, that sort of like movement or resistance here typically NIMBY or NIMBYism, not in my backyard is what it stands for. Is there a we term for it? it in, in a oh, there you go. We got some, we got some overlap there. Yes, uh, we have uh, NIMBYs um, and we have folks that um, maybe subscribe to some very ancient thinking about people in, in public and social housing. Uh, and um, so it was, a, you know, a big challenge. They're concerned about their housing prices. They're concerned about crime. They're concerned about like maybe having to see them. I don't know. There was all sorts of very, um, you know, uh, strange um, and some very valid uh, complaints that came up and challenges to, you know, plannings and whatnot. But the truth is when you went to put a um, an apartment block or a, a set of townhouses in the suburb in Melbourne that has the second highest uh, level of household income, there was always going to be challenges, but we've pressed through and it's extraordinary what the community has done. So some folks, not a fan, uh, but then as the project went along, what we saw um, was different neighbours getting behind it. So the school kids, um, you know, wanted to volunteer to paint a wall and make a mural there and... Um, some senior sits group made blankets for the new residents for when they moved in and others have just done wonderful things to show that no hold up you're welcome here and that just sort of filled our spirits a little that we um yeah we're pretty pretty happy about that one I've got to say and um uh yeah uh, even the crane I recall this actually there was the crane um as it was in construction uh, oversight, actually had a kind of flag flying from it that, oh, I don't know, that said something like everybody's welcome here or something. It was just really beautiful. So, uh, <laughs> um, and just making sure also that we tell many of the good stories as well. So we've done that, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And that question was also from uh, Betty. Um, Let's see. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, also a question from Betty. How long does it take to get uh, permits to build a project? Uh, she knows it's a really big barrier here. And did mm. you have to change any of the bureaucracy or policies to allow for this big build um, plan? Yeah. Uh, Betty, your questions are excellent. <laughs> Firstly, um, as are the others, but uh, this is a, this is one that I hadn't explored, but is worth um, talking about. So, as I said, the big housing bill came up as a um, sort of economic stimulus project, in part, uh, as well as um, 
you know, a project to tackle uh, the social problem of the, of, you know, of our times. Uh, and with that, we knew that, you know, if you're going to invest $5 billion in housing, uh, that's a, enormous, but you cannot have that drag on for years and years and years in, <laughs> in the sort of permit approval process and state governments and local governments and challenges through the courts and other such things and not to say that that's not all entirely valid because it, it truly is um, but what we really um, needed was to lay the foundations for that to be as easy as possible frankly uh, and so there were um, some pandemic specific um, planning changes that were made that enabled a great number of these projects to go through a lot, um, a lot easier than they had previously. So I'll just say that that was, uh, for us, something that made these projects be in the position where you see now, where they're being completed, and we've got three thousand folks moving in this year and others previously. And you see in that video, yeah. there are many, many in the pipeline over the four years. So we're, yeah. That helped, that helped making um, the path to approvals a lot easier. Sounds like you really had to approach this from a lot of directions at the same time and be flexible. Um, yes. Well, we have about five minutes left. So I think we probably can de delve into some of the bigger, one more bigger question. Oh, or okay. If like, or if you'd like, I think I could potentially rapid fire out if, uh, four questions for you. Uh, that might be able to be have shorter answers if uh, oh, you're indulgent. You want that? Okay, here we go. Uh, Anonymous asks, are there a set aside number of units for Indigenous populations and how are these goals decided? Okay. Uh, yeah, as I said, we had, um, whatever, I think it was 10%, I have to... 10%? Whatever that, what that was. Um, I may have recalled you saying that. 10, I think it was 10. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Uh, uh, they were decided in partnership with the uh, responsible minister for Aboriginal affairs who ha we've got high, high rates of um, uh, Indigenous homelessness in our state. And so we really kind of wanted to tackle that as a key cohort. So um, people had an opportunity to sort of bid in uh, <laughs> Um, hi, you've got five point, you've got 12,000 places being built. It would be really good uh, if some of them went to these key cohorts and then there was an opportunity um, for people to kind of make the case that we really need some for, you know, people experiencing mental health, victim survivors of family violence, Indigenous populations, over 55-year-old women, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was sort of a, a process prior to that announcement where different ministers uh, were able to pitch um, and, uh, you know, speak with the housing minister and come up with, you know, a really deliberative way to tackle um, some of those cohorts that have really, really, um, you know, high numbers. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And just because uh, our, our listeners want to know this, uh, the numbers I could find on the Australian government website is about 3.2% of Australians are Indigenous. I just want to give yeah. that context for our listeners. Yeah. Um, Yes. And so in our state, though, I, I don't know how it works there. We have dispersed like across the nation. We're actually less than 1% in mm. our state. So less than 1% of Victorians are Indigenous. Whereas if you go up to the north where it's um, those populations are far, far less. We're much more impacted by, um, you know, colonisation and, and other things down here that are not great. Um, yeah. Thank you for that additional context. Um, mm. Next one, a uh, former legislator, uh, Galen Fox, asked us, um, mentioned that we can't build modular homes here because unions block the competition to old-fashioned home construction. Why don't Australian unions block modular construction? Is there any effort on that part? That last part is something I'm, I've added. Um, because different um, different unions are involved in the um, construction of modular okay. homes and that they're union jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. So that helps. Um, so uh, whether they are, we've got a, a manufacturing workers union that are quite involved in the manufacturing of these homes and they work um, in partnership. Uh, of course, there is 
so much pipeline uh, for a construction work and there is opportunities aplenty uh, for um for construction uh, workers that they're not kind of losing out I think is probably worth saying uh, if you're a construction worker in this state you've got an incredible chance to uh, get and hold a high paying uh, safe and secure uh, union job uh, in this state and so there is not a um, there's there's very few risks to um, the union in terms of um, its aspirations, as well as we have some very high safety standards when it comes um, to the construction of modular home construction. Well, there you go. Thank you for that information. Uh, Ken Farm asks two questions, but I see we're right on the hour now, so I'll just yeah, do right. one. And it's Ken Farm, I know this gentleman's favorite question to ask. Uh, it's about the definition of what constitutes affordability. In the United States, we often use area median income. Um, yep. what constitutes affordable in Australia and Victoria more specifically? Uh, there is a definition that we have, and I'm just trying to find it, but I believe it is similar. It is actually a, um, uh, like a maximum of 30% of the median income of that particular geographic area. So we have two, we have the, we have a, a Melbourne, like the very, you know, the, the city, capital city based, and then we have a regional one as well. We split it. We don't have an affordable for the whole of the, um, for the whole of the state. We split it into regional and, and uh, capital. It's really helpful. In the United States, very often we do anything under 140% the median paying 30%. Do you line it up at exactly 100% for the median or do you allow like wiggle room on either side of that? We're still really landing, uh, I, I mean, I think there's a government definition, but the, the sector itself has a different definition and advocacy groups have a different one. We mm -hmm. don't have a uniform um, position yet on the definition, I believe, of affordable housing in our country. So there's some well, work to be done on that. So thanks, Ken, for asking. Well, well Senator Stanley Cheng isn't a huge fan of the AMI model here. So perhaps you're doing yourself a favor by not necessarily uh, all narrowing in on one definition. Well, um, Parliamentary Secretary Watt, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate hearing about all the exciting things going on in Victoria and wishing you folks all the best there. Lovely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll catch you the next Our Homes. Aloha.